Use every word to every song. I'm serious, he really does. And I was listening to that just now, and I don't know why I, that didn't stand out. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross. Oh my gosh, especially coming up on Easter. Well, praise God. I oh, we want to just take a moment to acknowledge our guest. If you're a guest of Loveland, first time guest or returning guest, would you just wave your hand real quick? Wave, uh, see your hand, see your hand. Uh, Miss Michael Noble is coming around. She has a card for you, and uh, you, she'll tell you what to do with that card. You, and um, she'll tell you what to do, because we have a present for you, because you've blessed us with your presence. Let's give God a hand clap for all of our, uh, all of our guests. And if you are a guest with us online, praise God for you. And, and we want you to know, even if you can't get out because of health, guess, and if you're elderly people or whatever, you can still be a member of Loveland. And I believe those instructions are right there on the phone, on, this, on video, because we don't want to leave you out. You need to be a part of a congregation. Praise God. Looking forward to what you're going to tell us, baby. Glory to God. Pastor, Pastor Baby Chuck. <laughs> Well, again, Bo, thank you. Elvina, thank you for bringing him to be with us today. There's a, there's a story that some of you may know. You may know, but uh, Wanda, I think you know it uh, based on your family, your great father who's gone home to be with the Lord many years ago and your mom who just recently went. But many years ago, there was a man, his name was Horatio. <laughs> Horatio G. Stafford. He had four beautiful daughters wonderful wife, and he was doing well, money in the bank. But it was in the day when transcontinental travel was by boat, and he, Mr. Stafford, sent his family on a trip to England, and on their way home, something tragic took place. Their boat sunk. And uh, he lost in that sinking his daughters and his wife. A messenger came to the door the next day to let him know, your wife your daughters, they've perished. He cried, wept, and cried out to God for some possible explanation, and none was to come right then. The next day, as he prepared himself to go to England to retrieve remains of his family, another messenger came to the door and said, are you Mr. Stafford? He said, yes. He said, H.G. Stafford? He said, yes, that's me. He said, well, uh, sir, I have some bad news for you. And he said, oh, well, I've already gotten the news that my wife and my daughters died. But he said, no, sir, I didn't even know you had a wife and daughters. He said, my news comes from your bank. You've lost everything that you had. <laughs> but he pulled together from friends enough money to buy a ticket, and he traveled to England to accompany his family back. And as they 
went across the oceans. He noted when the captain called him out to show them where the boat had sunk. He said, there's the spot. This is the place where your daughters and wife died. He said he could hardly take it. Ran back to his cabin and fell on his knees and began to weep again. But this time, taking pen to paper, he began to write. And the words came out like this. In peace, like a river, attendeth my way when sorrow like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. So, Bo, I had no idea you were going to sing that, but it comports, it fits so well with what we are looking at this morning. You see the title of the teaching this morning. It, it asks kind of theoretical question. Where was God? I'm a Christian. How could my mama die? Why did my husband leave me? How come I'm sick? Or sometimes it can get so much larger, bigger than you and what you're dealing with in a given moment. As is the case when you come to something like African American History Month. You know, most of us, we, okay, whatever happened, happened. But I want to beg you to think that it's a, it's a lot more than that. Four hundred A hundred million trillion tears. Hopes and dreams, just like you have. Feelings, just like. And it leads us to our topic for this morning. I'm going to read to you a passage. Uh, a little, one verse, we'll expand upon it as we go through this teaching. We'll expand upon it. But this one verse that has a piece of a diamond of truth to help us understand our pains, personal or planet-wide. It's from 2 Chronicles and chapter number 32. Watch how God's word reads. Just a little incident in the life of King Hezekiah. Just a little incident in his life. Watch this in verse number 31. It, it reads, However, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land. Watch this next phrase. God withdrew from him. Wow. Why? 
God withdrew from him in order to test him. That he might know all that was in his heart. I mean, here is uh, one of the mysterion mysteries about God. And we'll look at several, but this is one of them. Why in certain moments uh, does he seem so distant? Billy Graham said there are moments when it has felt to me as I prayed as if the heavens were like brass. And my prayer simply echoed off the ceiling. Stay here for a moment. I want to show you why. And when you get bigger, we mentioned a number of things last week, a number of things. The uh, man's inhumanity to man. The, uh, uh, the Vikings' attacks on uh, European lands. Uh, the Goths and the Visigoths and the abuse of people, kings over serfs and people enslaving other people simply because they had more guns or bow and arrows and making them personal property. Okay, go back to our original question. Where was God? In the midst of the pain, uh, confusion, Lord, uh, how do you explain yourself? Now, there's a, uh, when it comes to the issue of slavery, it's something that needs to be looked at. It's okay. You can draw close because all truth is God's truth, no matter where it comes from. And all truth is God's truth, no matter what it's about. We saw, we have seen over the last few weeks, a kind of setup for what we're talking about. As we looked at Romans 1, and we saw in Romans 1 that the wrath of God has been revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. And that what has taken place is that God, the very God who said, let there be, and everything that is came out of nothing. One poet said, he reached back into nowhere, grabbed a handful of nothing, threw it nowhere, and made everything there is. He's that great, that big, that amazing, that vast that strong, that supernatural. We would put it in a simple term, and it represents our first point. This big, gigantic word that every believer ought to know that God is the omnipotent God. Would you say it out loud with me? The omnipotent God. And I say that right in the middle of a right in the middle of a, a time where we just talked about H.G. Stafford, whose wife and kids, we just talked about uh, the Goths, the Visigoths, the Vikings. Uh, in Lisbon, Portugal in 1755, don't give me that wonky look because you, you come here to Loveland, you're going to learn something. In 1755, when, when a great earthquake shook the earth and Lisbon, Along the coast, that earthquake was so vast, so massive, didn't have measurements then, but historians guessed that it was about 7.7 on the Richter scale. It was so big, and it occurred on a Sunday morning where some people had gathered for church. Cathedrals fell. Church doors were torn off. 
Later, a New York Times writer put this for his headline. Watch the headline. What was God thinking? <laughs> it's just too much to believe that some who were there on a Sunday morning, and, and it's too much to accept, and it's too much that a God omnipotent, all-powerful, and at the same time, all-loving, could allow these things to happen. So I've introduced the subject, and I want to introduce a word to you this morning. Hang on to it. Remember this word. It's a word used in seminaries and often among philosophers. Uh, this word is the word theodicy. Theodicy. Say it out loud with me. Theodicy. Theodicy. Say it again. Theodicy. One more time. Theodicy. I ask you to say it because the, the fact of what I've presented, uh, sometimes it can be so overwhelming that you don't want to participate. <laughs> and if I can't have your voice, I'll probably soon lose your mind. We want both. You notice this is a compound word or two. Uh, the first is the word theo. You've been learning what theo has meant. Uh, theo is a term, a Greek term for, say it out loud, for God. And the dicey from the word diike uh, is a word that is for justice. So it sounds like God of justice, but that's really not what this means in this case. Though it is God and justice combined together, it comes out like this. Here's how it comes out. Theodicy is a matter, come here, scoot up close, of justifying God. A few years ago, while I sat on the board of a university not too far from here, uh, one of our professors went to Harvard to speak and probably didn't know that the report of what she said was going to be uh, placed in the newspapers all the way out in California. And it came. And what she said is this. Watch this posture that she put together. Come here, come here, get this now. Watch what she said. She said... Uh, we say that God is omnipotent. And what does omnipotent mean? All powerful. And at the same time, she said, we say God is loving. She said, he's either all powerful or all loving. But she said, he could not be all loving <laughs> and all powerful. Because if he's loving, there wouldn't be evil if he could do something about it. And if he were all powerful and uh, evil happens, then he doesn't want to do something about it. Her mistake goes back to that word, how to justify God. How you deal with him who can hit a straight lick with a crooked stick? How do you deal with him who can speak and make planets so large that had they come within a hundred million miles of this one, it would destroy us. How do you deal with him who makes the sun so hot that we can't get any closer than we are? Or who makes a sky so vast that we can't even imagine the end of it? How do you deal with so that, that first word is this, yeah, he is omnipotent. That, that first point is, he is omnipotent. And, and you note how the, how the text reads that, that in the verse, here, here's what was said in the verse. Uh, that This was powerful, so, so strong from uh, the word of God when in Second Chronicles 32, I'll repeat it again. However, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, so somebody from 
Babylon came to Hezekiah, to Israel, whom they sent, the word says, to him to inquire about the wonder. Somebody say wonder. To inquire about the wonder that was done in the land. Uh, Some postulate that this is not like one event, but probably more than one. I'll come back and explain that in a minute. Uh, But it's the wonder, the stuff, the the good things that are happening. You, You know, there are signs wonders and miracles Uh, in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Acts, we find that. Uh, They they came to ask him, King Hezekiah, uh, tell us about this. (laughs) What's going on? So here's what you'll see if you read the verses right before this one, beginning right around verse 25. Here's what you begin to see, that they had built some works in the land that were just amazing. I mean, they were some of the first people who began to build uh, infrastructure for the cities. They were some of the first to build those infrastructures for the cities, waterworks, things of that nature. And uh, the fame of it was spreading all about the world. In addition, they put together a military machine that protected the people. That was amazing. The government was amazing. The money the government was receiving was amazing. Come here, come here. Here's what happened. When you read the earlier parts of the verse, here's what you also find out. God was blessing, and Hezekiah was bragging. Hezekiah got it twisted. And if you've never done that before, um, then learn a lesson because you will if you're going to be as blessed as you claim you are. I mean, we say it all the time. How you doing? Blessed and highly favored. Hezekiah was blessed and highly favored, and he was proud of it. And his heart got in the wrong place. And here's what the book says. The Bible says, and I'll paraphrase it, it says that God saw that. And so a a kind of uh, condemnation, chastening, was over his head. Looming like a cloud. It was a way that God was saying, I'm going to get you. (laughs) Not right now. I'm going to get you, though. It's coming. It's coming. And uh, before that chastening came, for whatever reason, the Bible doesn't explain, Hezekiah repented. Well, it does give us a little bit of an explanation because Hezekiah got sick. Uh, that'll humble you. Hello? (laughs) I thought somebody had to have an amen up in the house today. That'll humble you. He got sick. He got really sick. He got tremendously sick. And the Bible says he turned his heart towards the Lord. I might point out how that happened. When you read in the book of of Isaiah, uh, you begin to see it because here's how it happened and why it happened. I believe it's chapter uh, 10, when Isaiah was given a word from the Lord. He was told to go to Hezekiah and let him know in the midst of his sickness, go tell him he's going to die. Wouldn't you like to be that prophet? The king is sick, and your job is to go tell him that he's going to die. So in Isaiah chapter 39, uh, Isaiah goes to him to let him know, the Lord gave me a word for you, king. You're dying. And uh, then Isaiah had done his job, so he left. He's walking out, but you understand, he was in the inner court, the king's chamber, and outside was the Outer court. Amen. Usually when there's an inner court, there's an outer court. All right. So uh, Isaiah comes in the inner court, lets him know God says you're going to die. Walks out. He's in the outer court. Hezekiah, the Bible puts it this way. I love this. Turned his face 
against the wall. Whew. You ever been to a point where you have to turn your face against the wall? It means you're not looking for the future. You're not even looking for things and you, you, you're not looking at the beads and the bangles. You're not looking at your bank account. You're not looking at all the friends you have, nor are you looking at all you have to wear. All you've got in front of your face is a flat wall. And he cried out to God, oh God, I repented. I've come to you and I ask you to forgive me. Now I got the news that I'm about to die. And God said, Hezekiah, just hold on a minute. And God speaks to the prophet. Isn't it good to be a prophet who can hear from the Lord this quick? Isaiah is no further than the outer court. He hadn't even left the palace yet. When God speaks to Isaiah and tells him, go back and let him know that I'm going to give him 15 more years. So Isaiah goes back in. He says, Hezekiah, my king, the Lord said he's going to give you 15 more years. And to prove to you that it is the Lord, which would you rather have? We can turn the clock back 10 degrees, or we can turn it forward 10 degrees. You know, somebody ought to say something. <laughs> and how deep that is, how deep that is, probably not seen on the surface because what, what was taking place was truly miraculous. In Joshua chapter 10, there, there was a place where Joshua and was leading the children of Israel in a battle, and uh, it was starting to get dark. They couldn't finish winning that battle, and Joshua called out to God and told him to do something about the dark that was coming to keep them from finishing their task. And so God told Joshua to speak and the sun would stand still. And so Joshua spoke, and the sun stood still. Read, read Joshua chapter, I'm just trying to put it all together, fit it all together. Read Joshua chapter 10. When he spoke, the Bible puts it this way in Joshua 10, that the sun stood still about, not, all, not 24 hours, but about the space of a day. Not quite a whole day. Almost a day. And now here we are later with Hezekiah. And the Lord tells Isaiah, let him know. I'm going to move it 10 degrees forward or backward. Hezekiah says, you know, going forward is easy. Let's go backwards. 10 degrees. Remember that thing with Joshua? About 24 hours. Here we come with Hezekiah. 10 degrees. If you are one that follows your horoscope, let me give you something. It's off by one full day. And there it is. <laughs> Somebody going to have to buy the tape and rewind that. It's off by a whole 24 hours. Not according to the Bible scholars. Uh, it's off by 24 hours according to mathematical scientists. And the 24 hours is the combination of those two miracles. So, excuse me for a minute. Hey, man. All right, here we go. Uh, so, so, watch this. So, the omnipotent God who can move the start, the stop, the time, of a day. <laughs> the omnipotent God. That's who we serve. All powerful. <laughs> mighty in his works. Mighty in wonder. Mighty in beauty. Mighty in his plan. 
mighty in his goodness, mighty in his love, created a miracle. And now these fellows are saying, tell us about it. How'd that happen? And that takes us to our second. Watch the second point. The second point here of this, what's the big word we started with? Theodicy? Watch this. The whole idea of trying to understand God with good and evil, of how to reconcile a good God with evil in the world, how to reconcile why bad things can happen to good people. The second part of theodicy, some say, is this thing. It's called the omnibenevolent God. Omnibenevolent. Now, again, omni, omni just means all. Now, you know what benevolent means. All benevolent is all loving, all good, and probably a well-placed term, all good, because here's the idea behind it. It is not a idea that I subscribe to. I don't believe the Bible subscribes to it. Watch. Here's why. Because it says that everything that happens is good. And God never said that everything that happens in creation, in your world, in your life, is good. But here's what he did say in Romans chapter 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good. It don't have to be good to work together for good. Uh, my, my mama used to make biscuits from scratch. And uh, I know that everything in there is good to some of y'all, but, you know, I think it was baking powder. I think there was some, a lot of raw eggs, and I think there was some flour, yeah, and milk, and a uh, few other things that, what? The, what was the lard? What was that thing? That was fish. I mean, you know what? By itself, that stuff. I mean, I, I did not hang around the kitchen while she was putting it all together. But when she got it all in the spot, by itself, it's not good. But it does work together for good. I spent most of my life along the Mississippi River till I came to California. I was born down in Louisiana. Same, same place you were born in, Carol. I was born down there in Louisiana. And, uh, but one or two years old, my family moved up to the Chicago area. Uh, down by Louisiana, that's the uh, mouth of the Mississippi River in New Orleans. New Orleans. <laughs> uh, that, that's the mouth. But the source of the river is up in Minnesota. Uh, it comes down past Chicago. One of the tributaries is the Chicago River. Another is the Des Plaines River. I spent a lot of time around those rivers. I found out something hanging around those rivers. Uh, Dale, you know something about the Des Plaines River. You, you lived 50 feet at the most from the Des Plaines River, a tributary of the Mississippi. I learned something. That, that river, which starts in the north and empties out in the south, sometimes turns west. <laughs> I ain't trying to go west. I'm trying. Sometimes that river will turn east. There are times, believe it or not, with this river headed from north to south, turns back north. Your job is not to figure out the flow. 
Your job is to stay on the boat. He didn't say all things are good. He said all things work together. For good. Watch, watch why. Watch why. Watch. Stay here. Come here. Up a little closer. Watch this. What happens? What happens? Another way. The things that happen are not God. The problem is we begin to think they are. Good fortune, good juju, good luck. And we think that which happens in creation is God. God demands to be separated in our hearts from his creation. That if we make the mistake of thinking that what happens in creation is God, then we begin to reduce God to creation. And we begin to worship and serve, as Romans 1 says, the creature more than the creator. See, what happened was Adam and Eve dwelt in a place we call the Garden of Eden, and they were in fellowship with God. But when they sinned, they broke that fellowship with God. Adam, not only mankind fall, but all of creation fell. Read Romans chapter 8, and you see there that not only did Adam and Eve fall, but everything fell. In came earthquakes. In came tornadoes. In came the common cold. In came cancer. In came disease. Because the creature with the fall of man was separated from the creator. God is saying, I want you to know this piece. You can take that insurance policy. Stop calling that an act of God. I didn't do that. I didn't do the tornado. I didn't do the hurricane. I didn't do COVID-19. Your fathers separated themselves and sold their birthright to a sinister snake that we call Satan. Okay, Why don't you just take over? Because I gave the legal rights to y'all. And you gave your legal rights to him. So we have to come and take it back. We have to take it back by faith. He's benevolent. He's always intends good towards you. But he says it like this. He says uh, that he that dwells in the shadow of the Almighty shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. He, he, he says it so powerfully, so strong. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. We are in occupied territory. Somebody said with me, we're in occupied territory. And it's important to know that. It's important to know that. You get get too many of them Hallmark cards (laughs) that tell you God is everywhere and everything and God everything. No, we are in a world that is occupied territory. There's a curse on this nation, on this world. Galatians chapter 2 tells us that Jesus, by his cross, has broken that curse. All right, so is he omnibenevolent? Uh, That is his heart intention to us. But there are some ways and respects in which we must breakthrough in order to experience his presence. When, when the praise team was singing, there was such a rich anointing. 
early service, 7.30. And again, in this service, the, the palpable presence of God. The, the spiritual anointing, Bo Williams, that came as you sang that song. God was already here. He was, but there was, there was a holy presence reserved for the heart that seeks him. You can come to church, sit right next to me, and you just walk away talking about they sang good, except for one note, maybe two. You can come to church, sit right next to your husband or your wife, and they are enraptured by the glow and the presence of God. And you walk away talking about let's stop at the hamburger stand. You missed it, they got it. There is a presence. And so that third word, is the omnipresence of God. And that, that presence comes in levels. It's the reason why when they built the temple in the Old Testament, there was the outside of the temple where most worshipers could come. Then you could walk in to the temple where some others could come. Then you had the outer court where many could come. You had the inner court where few could go. Then you had the holiest of holies. Where one priest chosen out of all the priests once a year could go into that holy place. Into the very presence of God. Here's the catch. Here's the catch. Here's the catch. It was there when Christ Jesus was crucified on the cross. It was that, that holiest of holies where the, where the curtain was torn in two. So guess who can go in now? Ooh, look at somebody and tell them who can go in. Look at two other people, tell them who can go in. You, can, you ain't told nobody yet. You can go in. You can go in. You can go in. You can go in. The presence of God, the omnipresence of God. But listen to what he told Hezekiah. The Lord left him. He said to test him. So listen, let me, let me kind of summarize it all, pull it together on this great theodicy. During this time of African-American history, as we look at history itself, man's inhumanity to man, during this period of time, how does that fit into the idea of a theodicy? reconciling a good God and evil that takes place. How does it reconcile? How does it, how does it fit in? If you watch God, this is part of what we'll be dealing with Wednesday night at 6 o'clock in the minister's lyceum. If you watch God in history, if you pay attention to him, we are so selfish that all we want to know is what is he doing for me and what have you done for me? Oh, y'all knew that one already. Lately. Uh, but if you watch it, here's what you begin to see. That God has always been present in every nation. And Romans chapter 1 makes it so plain that the problem with all of our ancestors, as much as there are many people who want to worship their ancestors now, Big mistake. Your ancestors, many of whom served the living God, and now you want to worship them. That these, in Acts chapter 17, the Bible <laughs> makes it so plain, so pure, so perfectly put. In fact, let me share with you a verse from Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse number 24. Watch this. Watch this. It, it tells us this. God was in India. He was in the Americas. God showed up <clears throat> in Africa. He showed up in Europe. Listen to verse 24. He says there powerfully that this God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, 
does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands <coughs> as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life breath and all things. And he is made from one blood, from one blood, every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. You can't stop his plan. That's why that title last week was Truth. You can't stop God. You can't stop him. Because he is the omniscient God. He is the omniscient God. You can't stop God. Uh, we, we saw how in Genesis chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, God had a conversation with himself and said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. God, a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, had a conversation with himself, said we're going to make man, make him just like us. Chapter 2, verse 7, explains us how he did it, where he took dust, then breathed in the dust, and man became a living soul. So there, spirit, mind, and body, in one act of God, which men was that? Which race was that? All of them. So here's something you ought to know. You can't hold any of us down. Black, white, brown, yellow, red. You can't hold any of us back. You try to hold them back. And you give, you give one of them a basketball, he becomes LeBron James. You give another a horn. And uh, he becomes Johnny Coltrane. You give another one a chance to run for office, he becomes Barack Obama. You, you, no matter what you do, there's somehow that every man made in the image of God is going to rise up. That's the truth of God. So, but you can try to hide it. And it was Sojourner Truth who said that truth is indestructible. And uh, Lalabila, you, you may have never heard of that. But, but that, that whole false narrative that Christianity is a white man's religion, a, a false Narrative. Lala Bila helps to prove that. You see the picture there. The, this, these stone churches uh, carved each one, six of them, out of one rock. They are churches. It was 1100 A.D. when they were made. Why am I saying so? Because Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. <laughs> These churches to worship Jesus were built 300 years before Columbus's mama bore him. If you go to what is now Angola. It was in a place called Mighty Congo. Mighty Congo was, was just uh, for most folks uh, and even for many now. Eh, it's nothing. It's just uh, they, they never knew anything. And, and this is where you can, you can, if you'll join me in understanding the universality uh, that is the oneness of God's creation. Uh, Melville uh, Hersovitz, a white man, in, uh, he's the first one to set up what was called a Department of Africana Studies at a major university. Now, let me tell you why that's significant. First, because he was white. Yes, that's significant. Uh, second, because he did it in 1948 at Northwestern University. You know what his principle was? Y'all been lying. 
You've been telling us that Africa was just jungle. <laughs> you, you've been saying that these folks were stupid, that they didn't understand anything, that their treasures, when we find something they've done in art or find something they've done in mathematics, uh, it was because they borrowed it from somebody else. Uh, they were too stupid to do it themselves. And Melville Hersevich said, no, no, no. What happened was <laughs> we stole it from them and then tried to wipe it all out. So nobody would know that there was any intelligence in Africa. In addition to Lala Bila, here, here's a church called the Cathedral of the Savior of Congo. I might point out that when you, when you think of, of Congo, you normally would think C-O-N-G-O uh, because that's the way it's spelled now. Uh, since the great abuse that Belgium put upon Congo, that this, uh, that this cathedral of the Holy Savior of Congo spelled with a K, the borders stretch so wide, so far. You note the date? It was built in 1493, a year after Columbus sailed the ocean blue. I use him as a marker more than anything else. So as to say, we must, whether you're black, white, brown, yellow, red, we must reclaim black history. It, it, the world, listen, the world doesn't make sense without that. God doesn't make sense without that, unless you know that he's always been at work. Listen, take your Bible when you get a chance and look in the book of Acts. The Jews were getting saved when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. Jews and Jewish proselytes were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 10, the first European, Cornelius, the Italian, and his household was saved. But between Acts chapter 2 with the Jews and Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius was a black man that we know as the Ethiopian eunuch. <laughs> I ain't saying that to make the black man better. That's ridiculous. That's worse than, that's at least as bad as what I'm trying to say is this, that that which was meant to destroy, that was hidden, shows the power of Sojourner's truth when she said truth is indestructible. And the omniscient God knew that a moment like this would come, that it would come when we'd have to decide. And I understand what some people, well, let's not even talk about it. No, we should. And embrace it. And, and understand it. Feel it. It's okay to love one another. It's why I pray and have been praying, God, raise up a multicultural, multiracial, beautiful movement out of this church. That's why I pray that every day in my prayer life while I'm praying for you. And I believe God is going to do that, but we ought to understand it. It doesn't happen without dealing with what has happened. We don't come out of it bitter. We come out better. We don't come out mad. We come out motivated. We look at it and we say, let's take what has happened and go by the Spirit of God to the world. Here's what Jesus told. We're not going to reach the world anymore. We're not going to reach the world anymore just with a bunch of four spiritual law books. I live by the four spiritual laws. I'm here in California because of the four spiritual laws. But look, here's what Jesus said. They will know you're Christians by your love.
Father, we thank you that you are the God of theodicy. And no, we, we didn't complete our thought this morning, but we laid the groundwork for completing it. To understand how this kind of thing can be working together for good. I don't know how. I don't know how. I trust you, though. I believe you. I know that love is the answer. 400 years. A hundred million trillion tears. Still love for you and for one another. Pray that you raise us up. Use us mighty. Use us strong. Our heads are bowed. Now, eyes are closed. It may be that you're here today and you might say, you know what, Pastor Chuck, I hear you. But, you know, it's going to take God to make me able to embrace that. Now, there could be a couple reasons why you say that. Not you, Maybe you're angry, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe you're embarrassed. You don't want to have to deal with that. Maybe you're um, just one who likes to be inspired at church to go on with Monday. Or maybe you're one who hears the voice of God and you're ready to say wherever this goes, whatever this is about, by the blood of Jesus, I'm in. I'm in. If you're watching online, that, that may be you. you. You want to say, I'm in. What's next? What's the next step? I want to invite you. If you're online, watch where it says, respond to God. Go right there. Indicate there. Send me your information. How to get in touch with me. And I'll send you some helpful information. You see if God is not speaking. And if you're here in the house, your first step is getting to know Jesus. And if you want to get to know him, in a moment, we're all going to stand. And when we do, I want to invite you to make your way to the front. Come on and say an everlasting yes. Come on. Father, draw as only you can do. You said, Lord Jesus, if any man comes to me, it's because the Father draws him. Draw. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together now. Come on, if you need to come, come right now. I know the Lord already. I know the Lord already. I'm in good standing with God, but I want to make a decision. Come on, come on right now. While others are walking, you walk too. Come now, come on. Someone else, you say, I'm, I'm away. I've been backslidden. I know, I know God, but I've been away. Third person. Third person. You want to say, I don't know him, but I want to know him. I want to know God for myself. Would you step on out and come right now? Come on, step on out and come right now. Pray that you'll say yes to the Lord. You can say no to me. Say no to the praise team, to the music. Mama, daddy, wife, husband. But don't say no to God. Come on now. God has spoken to your heart. Please come. Anyone else who wants to come? Come on. I see you. Come on. Come on. Step on out and come. Yes. Come on right now. Father, we thank you that there's room, blessed room. Are you coming? Are you coming? There's blessed room at the cross. Lord Jesus, you made room at the cross. We thank you for that. I bless every heart, every soul, every man, every woman in the house. Bless these that have come forward with every spiritual blessing. In Jesus' name, everybody say together, amen, amen. Give the Lord a great big hand, praise, amen.
Praise God. Now, do either of you have product in the lobby? All right. Praise God. For now, historic apologetics. Just to begin to understand a little deeper, more in depth, that. Now, the more in depth Bible study is at 7 o'clock. That's what I'm telling you. I want to get a chance to go to another. Oh, that's good.